Hello, everyone. Welcome to Data Engineers Lunch number 27, no, 28, excuse me. Um, today we'll be covering PETL or PETL for data engineering. Obi will be the speaker today. He is a software engineer here to not. Um, your organizers and co organizers for this event are Raul Singh, Arpin, and myself. If you are interested in helping us find speakers or getting us sponsors, uh, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Um, our emails are listed here. Um, so that could include uh, finding us speakers or sponsors when we are uh, back to making this a live event uh, for pizza, beverages, stuff like that. We are a part of a larger community, Data Community DC, um, and we believe in a strong, diverse culture. So we support people of all races, gender, sexual orientation, religion, that sort of thing, and expect um, respect to be given to all. Some of the other organizations involved in Data Community DC are listed here, and you can find out more about Data Community DC um, in their blog here at uh, datacommunitydc.org slash blog or events.datacommunitydc.com. What we cover here, we cover everything related to data engineering. Um, so that could be different databases, uh, different ETL tools. Uh, I know we've, we've discussed a, about a ton of different topics here. And uh, if there is something that you're an expert in and would like to share, uh, like I said before, we are always looking for speakers, so feel free to share your knowledge. Um, at this time, anyone new to the event, we would like to uh, hear from you. So if you feel comfortable sharing your camera, saying hi, what you do with data. Um, let me see if there's anyone new. Looks like there are some names in here I don't recognize. Do you guys feel comfortable uh, saying hi and what you do? I see. Joel or Dallas, maybe. You guys don't have to if you don't want to, though. Hi, I'm Joel. I've been on these meetings many a time. Oh, sorry about that. But thanks to, happy to have you here again. Um, hi, I'm Mike, and this is my first time. All right, glad to have you guys here. So some group rules. If you have a question, please ask it. Sometimes the speakers, oh, sorry to interrupt you, Dallas. I see you unmuted for a second. Hi, I'm Dallas. I don't know if you can hear me all that well. Um, I, I live in Wilmington, Delaware, and I do a lot of data management um, and work with databases, uh, do end-to-end -end um both capture of data through uh websites web systems um and analysis downstream analysis of the data so yeah all right happy to have you here and uh look forward to hear what you have to contribute once we get to the conversation portion um some of the group roles we have here if you have a question please ask it <clears throat> either in the chat or sometimes the speakers um, are okay if you just unmute and ask or have something to add to a particular part of the topic. Um, Obi will go over that when he takes over. Uh, please be polite and courteous to others. And uh, as mentioned before, share what you know. This is meant to be sort of a discussion. So if you're an expert in a certain area or just know kind of finer details about whatever's being discussed, uh, please feel free to uh, unmute and share what you know. Here to not, we deal with global um, data and real-time data, um, all things related to Cassandra, um, as well as Spark and Kafka is kind of our wheelhouse. Um, we certainly cover a lot, lot more things. Um, and Datastax is a sponsor of this event as well. Uh, along with George Washington University, um, they allow us when we're doing in-person meetups, they, they've been kind enough to give us some venue locations and hopefully we'll be able to get, get to doing that 
later this year again or sometime in the near future as COVID kind of becomes a thing of the past, hopefully. Some of the program sponsors we have listed here, data stacks as mentioned before in Eastern Foundry. And some of the organizational sponsors to Data Community DC, um, you can see Capital One, American University, et cetera. 15 second announcements. This is a point in time where we like, if anyone has uh, jobs, meetups, hackathons, conferences, classes, anything coming up that they would like to share with the group, uh, please feel free to do so right now. All right, no announcement. Um, for not here, we are always hiring full-time or part-time positions, data platform operators, engineers, and architects. You can find out more at careers.anant.us and remote positions are available. Some upcoming events, we have uh, the sister lunch to data engineers lunch, Cassandra lunch, migrating PostgreSQL to Cassandra. Um, and the next data engineers lunch will be covering inter an introduction to Apache night five. Um, you can also check the meetup for Data Community DC for other events as well. Uh, data Wranglers tends to have weekly lunch calls and there's, there's a lot of other events listed here, um, as well as we update upcoming topics at anot.us slash events. And with that, um, I will pass it over to Obi. Second to share my screen. All right, hopefully that's visible to everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Obi Anamnachi. I'm a software engineer at Nant Corporation. Um, I've been doing these uh, data engineers lunches basically since we started doing them. Um, and our topic for this week is PETL for data engineering. Um, it's part of a sort of ongoing series. Um, oh, we already have a question in the chat. Will the presentation be shared at the end? Um, so the way we generally share our presentations, one, this will be up on YouTube like this. The video from this meeting will be up on YouTube in a couple of days. And then also on blog.anot.us, our, uh, our blog site will be publishing a blog post for this event, which will have a slide share link of this presentation, all the slides in it at the end. Um, so both the video and the slides will be available in a couple of days. Um, yeah, so generally, I prefer to receive questions during the presentation in the chat. Um, and if there, if we are in a sort of transitional period um, in between, say, the presentation and the demo, or at the end of the demo, um, or even right now, uh, and you have questions, then that is a fine time to just unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, but otherwise, if I'm actively giving the presentation, then I would prefer questions come in the chat. So today's presentation is part of a sort of series that we have going on on Python um, ETL tools. Um, today we're covering PETL. We've already talked about uh, sort of Airflow, Luigi, um, some Spark stuff, Bonobos, um, tools like that. Uh, and today we're covering PETL. So the obvious question, what is PETL? Uh, it's a Python ETL tool, obviously, because it's part of the series on Python ETL tools designed specifically to be easy and convenient to use rather than to be highly performant, uh, fast, or capable of handling, handling large amounts of data. Um, it makes sense of use of lazy evaluation and iterators um, in order to you know, comply um, with a number of different initial data formats and things like that. Um, and to save memory. Um, it's meant for sort of thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands row data sets. Uh, theoretically, you can use it for millions of rows, um, but that will generally be much slower than if you used a tool built for performance. Um, so it's not the best for if you have very large data sets or a high performance application. Um, 
PETL tool, PET, PETL as a tool supports both functional object oriented or object oriented programming styles um, and includes an executable that you can use to perform simple data transformations from the command line directly. Uh, so it is a Python tool, but if you call it by name from the command line um, with certain types of simple arguments, then it will do um, simple uh, transformations um, and give you the results just on the shell. Um, rather than you having to go into Python and actually write out a process. Uh, so first step, uh, extract. And we also cover load here pretty much all the time because they're basically the same. Um, so before we really get into this, we've sort of talked about in, in previous parts of this series, um, a sort of dichotomy between different types of ETL tools that we see. Um, and PETL falls a little bit somewhere in the middle, but it's definitely more one type than the other. Um, so the two types that we discussed are one, um, they facilitate easy loading. Um, they have an internal data representation. They um, include code for simple common transformations that people will want to do over and over again. Um, things like joins, et cetera. Um, easy transformations that you might want to use in a bunch of different contexts. Um, and then the other is sort of, well, okay. So the first group contains things like bonobos or pandas that we've talked about before. Um, but the second group is more about scheduling, about facilitating your data pipelines, about um, stuff like that. So Luigi, Airflow, and stuff that we've discussed like that, scheduling tools, pipeline managers, all that sort of stuff um, falls into that category. PETL is definitely in the first category, um, but because it uses lazy evaluators, you can sort of put it in the pipeline management category if you wanted to, um, because if you set up, say, four or five different steps in your transformation um, in your Python file, and you wanted to, say, get some of the data from step four, uh, when you run the file, it will actually only run up to step four um, and handle all the preceding steps because lazy evaluation means that you don't evaluate your um, functions until you're actually trying to see the result from them or use it somewhere else. So <laughs> first step is extraction and loading of data. Um, PETL includes a set of from and to functions for loading from files and common databases. Um, if you leave the parameters completely empty, it loads from standard in. Um, so you can pipe data to it if you wanted. Um, you, it can compress and decompress files if you give it files with uh, .gz, .bgz, or .bc2 um, formats. It will try to compress or decompress them when reading or writing. Um, and it can also read files if you give it an HTTP address directly, um, the URL of a file, it can read that file in as well. Um, and it includes helper functions uh, besides the to and from function um, that are for interacting with specific file formats. Um, so you can turn Python objects into Python objects and collections into your PETL tables. You can turn comma or tab delimited uh, separated value files, so delimited files into, um, into your PETL tables. You can turn pickled, um, which is the binary representation of Python files. Um, the, you pack them into pickle files. Um, so it's an extension of the way Python objects can be turned into, into PETL tables, but specifically from ones that have been packed into pickle files. Um, you can turn text files, XML files, HTML, JSON, et cetera. All, you can turn them all into, um, into PETL tables, but you can also interact with databases via SQL Alchemy, or you can interact with uh, data representations for other Python data utilities. Things like NumPy arrays or pandas data frames uh, can be translated directly into PETL tables. 
Um, and then you can also create custom data sources. The way that data sources in PETL work um, is they have to follow the conventions for table containers and they have to follow the conventions for table iterators. Um, and there's a description of those conventions linked here. Um, but the, the standard for table iterators essentially just means that one, um, it first, it's an iterator and two, it first yields the header and then the data rows in order. Um, so you can basically write one uh, loader um, for any other sort of data repository that you're using. So moving on to the transform step, um, obviously, like I said, PETL includes a bunch of common data transformations that you might wanna use. Um, to split them into a number of categories, things like basic transformations get you head, tail, uh, slice if you want specific rows from, from your table. Um, you can concatenate or stack rows. Concatenate is to, uh, is to combine them so that the headers are conserved. Um, concatenate them so that headers are conserved. And then stack just stacks them on top of each other regardless of headers based on the order of the columns. Um, you can add fields, uh, both static and, um, and calculated fields uh, and columns to your tables. Um, you can manipulate the header, uh, which really is just a, a list of Python strings um, that determines what each column is called and how you extract it from the table. Um, you can do value conversions, uh, type conversions. You can apply simple conversion functions. Um, replace values, format strings, etc. cetera. Um, there is conditional row selection. Um, so if you have a condition and you wanna select all the rows that meet that condition, um, you can do that. You can do a uh, regular expression-based transformation, including search, uh, split, et cetera. All those things that Python regular expressions can do, you can apply them to your columns. Um, you can split up compound values. If you have inside of your table, um, a column that is set as a, as a list, um, you can split those up into individual columns. You can transform individual rows using mapping. Um, you can sort your tables, join two tables, do set operations like union and intersection. You can, there, oh, I don't have it here, but there are specific ones for like, for interacting with null values. Um, in this case, PETL just uses the normal Python none value um, as it's null. Um, and there are specific functions in there for dropping rows with nulls, dropping rows with nulls in specific columns, replacing nulls with values, all that sort of stuff. Um, you can deduplicate your tables, de delete duplicates from them. Um, and you can do ag aggregation, counts, queries, um, and basic statistics, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then it also includes a bunch of other utility functions that we can use. Um, so inside of their table object, they have get functions for different parts of the table that you might want to get. If you want to specifically pull out the headers or the data or values um, in this specific column, all that sort of stuff is possible. Um, it has specific function utility functions for visualization in a, if you're using a Python interactive shell, um, if you're using Jupyter notebooks, um, and if you want to just print um, your tables, um, it has support for all three of those options. And then it has parsers, um, which can be used to turn uh, string values into various things, um, including dates, times, timestamps, Boolean values, um, numbers, etc. cetera. Um, and then it also has uh, functions for getting count of your data, um, how much data is in your table, how many rows there are, that sort of thing. Um, you can do timing. Um, so elapsed time, it will say, put up a progress bar if you want it to, um, all that sort of stuff. You can do statistics on your tables. Um, max and min for various columns, mean and standard deviation, et cetera. And you can also do random generation of data within your tables with helper functions that they provide. And then they also have an extension, PETLX, um, that specifically is meant to contain um, anything that do doesn't really have a place in the standard PT PETL code, but acts as an extension. Um, so 
the thing one of the things that they have there is a bunch of um tools for if you have essentially uh there are various programs for doing genetics that output in particular file formats um and you can load those into petl uh using this sort of uh petl L lx framework and use that to do sort of dna research um and then there are also is support in PETLX for a sort of branching pipeline. Um, so it is sort of um, like the airflow pipelines we've described before, um, at least with the branching pipelines um, stuff added to it, where you can define dependencies and all you define all your different processes individually. Um, and then define dependencies and set up your your pipeline. Um, but rather than um, Airflow, that also includes a bunch of scheduling and other utilities for managing those pipelines. Um, PETLX will just, when you call it, it will run the entire pipeline, um, which is essentially what normal PETL does with uh, with lazy evaluation. But with PETLX, you can have branches in those pipelines. So you can do two types of processing and split out um, values that you want into two different files and save them in different places, things like that, um, which theoretically you can do in, uh, in PETL by itself as well. All right, uh, so we're gonna move on to the demo in a little bit, uh, but now is the time for questions. If anyone would like to speak up or put a question in the chat while I get set up, this is the time for that. All right, uh, so moving into the demo. Um, essentially, PETL is at least where I would place it as a data engineering tool. It's sort of a tool for um, prototyping your processes. Um, so if you have, say, a small amount of your example data, um, that's sort of an example of what you're going to go out and gather and process. Eventually, in some larger data pipeline, you can use PETL to prototype that, make sure that your steps are giving you the data in the format that you want in sort of a usable format for whatever you're going to use it for. Um, so in this case, we're going to use two data sets. Um, if you've seen these previously, it's probably because they're part of the <coughs> The CA Spark library, um, we're doing the wine quality um, data sets, which essentially take a look at a bunch of different, um, like actual measurable qualities from different red and white wines and try to, well, I mean, it's originally part of a machine learning sort of framework. So they're using it to predict um, given objective measurements about a new wine. Uh, what people will rate it as. So we have a set for red and white or white wines. And what we're doing um, in our first step, we load them in using from CSV. Um, we're giving it a header because as you can see, these uh, both of the CSV files are lacking in a header. They do not have one. So we're taking all of the header names from that uh, that machine learning um, sort of lesson, the way it defined them, and we're putting it in manually. Um, so we load from CSV, we set our header, um, we convert. Uh, the convert numbers is a helper function that PETL includes. Uh, what it does is it takes every string value um, in the in your table and it tries to convert it into a number starting with I want to say like floats and complex numbers and then try and transform it into int and etc cetera, etc cetera, until it's tried all its number formats um, before just giving you back the string at least if you put it in um, in loose mode if you put it in strict mode it will throw an exception uh, if uh, 
it can't transform it into a number. And then um, because we're pulling from two different data sets, one of which has white wines and one of which has red wines, we're using add field to add a static column called type uh, with the value red to all the red wines and then the value white to all the white wines. And then uh, we are filtering out um, wines of a low quality, essentially. Um, so what is decided here um, is that in table one for the red wines, the quality that we want to keep in our table is greater than six. And for the uh, white wines, the quality that we want to keep in our table is greater than four. And then we concatenate those two together using dot cat. Um, and then what we're doing is we're calculating values off of some specific uh, some specific columns in the table. Uh, so the table includes a fixed acidity and a volatile acidity. Uh, and what we've done is add those together to get a new um, a new column called max acidity. And then there is a free sulfur dioxide and a total sulfur dioxide, uh, which we subtract from each other to get a locked sulfur dioxide measure. Um, and then what we're doing is sorting uh, the resulting table by quality. Um, and then as a secondary index, we're sorting by the amount of sugar. Um, that's just really to mix things up um, because the way the data sets sort of shake out, uh, which you'll see once I run this, um, and all this does is get the tail, which is where all the high values are. Um, it gets 500 rows out and we use look all because we want to look at all 500. Uh, whereas if you just try to print a PETL table, um, it will give you the head, the first five rows of whatever that table is. Even if you call tail uh, with 50 rows, it will give you the first five rows of those 50 rows. Um, so you need to use look all to get all of your data um, to print normally. So I'm going to run this. And looking at our data, you can see that the way that the data sets shake out, um, all of our high quality wines pretty much, uh, first of all, everything that got a nine, and then also pretty much everything that got an eight are all white wines. Um, so even though we've limited uh, to only the high quality wines, um, in the data sets, there are very few red quality wines, which would could potentially pose an issue uh, for any sort of machine learning um, thing that you're doing with this data. Because, I mean, the data shows that white wines are better than red wines. Uh, and so maybe that's a bias that might be reflected in your model. Um, but as we can see, there are some red wines here. About um, and the reason why we're sorting on a secondary index of sugar rather than just sorting by quality is because it picks your secondary index uh, for you if you do that. Um, because obviously quality, it's integer values, so a bunch of them have the same. Uh, and the way it will sort it is it will put uh, all the red together and all the white together. Um, so this is just to sort of get rid of that separation, have it all mixed together. And that is just about all for today. Uh, so more questions uh, for a bit. We'll have time for questions about PETL. Um, and then after that, time for general data engineering discussion. So first, any questions about PETL? Um, all 
right? Anyone have a general data engineering discussion that they would like to have, a topic or a question or anything like that? Um, now is the time for that. I have a question about PETL. Um, so can you give a bit of a background on PETL's history, how long it's been around, uh, and, and you know, who is responsible for developing it and maintaining it? Um, I can't really speak to that. I believe PETL is a sort of open source project. And I don't know if it's actually backed by a big company or anything. Um, yeah, I don't really know too much. Um, all of their Looks like it's community maintained. Um, doesn't look like it has any really big uh, like company backing. Um, so it looks like it's just a, a project by people who wanted to use, uh, who wanted something simple to do data engineering in Python. Uh, is there a UI for PETL? No, uh, purely code based. You had said this uh, This isn't really meant for high speed or anything like that. It's just to kind of test the data. So you wouldn't necessarily want to integrate this into a like production level application. It's more so just messing around with, with the data you have. Yeah, no, I wouldn't personally uh, support putting this in a production environment. Um, the way I see it is good for prototyping your sort of processes. Um, before moving on to something more robust, um, whether that is a different um, ETL tool that has a sort of internal data representation like this, or some sort of hand coded um, data processing stuff that, you know, maybe switch to C++, do some data processing there, um, or use a tool like, uh, like Pandas, which could theoretically be underpinned with um, say Jython um, in order to do the processing in Java to get your results faster. I see. So is this thing kind of like a more lightweight product then if if you're just going to be doing, I don't know, pre pre actual production? Coding? Yeah, so this is uh, entirely Python. Um, and as far as speed goes, um, if you want something to be faster or more efficient, um, then it's better to have that underlied by a process in Java or C or something like that. Um, because Python types include a lot of sort of overhead um, in order to make it easy to program in, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of type stuff that has to go on under, under the hood, um, essentially. Whereas strictly type languages like C, like Java, et cetera, um, can do their processing faster because they don't have to deal with that overhead. Thank you. Oh yeah, something interesting about PETL that I didn't mention. Um, the way that they do um, filling of null rows, uh, filling in of missing values, uh, which is called imputation, um, 
is, I think, really strange, partially because it uh, processes everything with iterators. Um, so you can fill down, which will fill it in with the data from the previous row. Um, you can fill left and you can fill right, uh, which will fill it in with data from the column to the left and right, uh, none of which are types of imputation that I covered when I talked about imputation a couple of, uh, a couple of um, parts ago in the series. Um, where we talked about sort of default imputation, where you fill everything in with a default value, um, mean imputation, where you calculate the mean for the entire column and fill it in, um, and sort of like potential things like ML imputation, um, where you train a model to fill in those values based on the other values in the row. Um, because this is doing purely iterator-based, uh, like, calculations. Um, it can only fill either with data from the row above. I mean, you can write your own imputation code uh, for imputing, say, the mean or a default value. Um, <coughs> but the helper functions that it applies are fill down, fill left, and fill right. Yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Like you see how the first row has a missing value, uh, but it can't fill it in because there are no rows above that. It does seem strange, especially if they're like completely different types of data. Yeah, there's probably some situation where uh, where it comes in handy, but. I feel like it would be more useful to have a sort of, you know, mean imputation, fill mean or something like that. Uh, but I can see why it's not like easy to implement with just iterators and lazy evaluation. All right, uh, if there's nothing more, then I will finish up. Uh, you'll be able to catch the YouTube video of this um, on our YouTube channel, Anant Corp, um, and the blog for this later this week at blog.anant.us, uh, which is also where all the other blogs from this series and all the other stuff from our Cassandra lunches and data engineers lunches all end up. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, Obi, for the presentation. Thanks, Obi.